Hello, welcome to Encore here on France 24. I'm Rochelle Harrison-Pless. Thanks for joining us. Coming up... A man with a terrifying violent history finds a new life as a reformed character, but he's put to the test when his past and present collide. That's the premise of The Blade Artist by Scottish writer Irvin Welsh. The dark and captivating thriller has just hit bookshelves here in France. The novel reviving one of Welsh's most iconic characters from the train spotting universe. The acclaimed author joins me on the show. Irvin Welsh, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me, Rochelle. The Blade Artist has uh, just been released here in France as L'Artiste au Couteau. Uh, the character of Jim Francis, a.k.a. Francis Begbie, whom uh, we first met uh, in Train Spotting, he's back and he has to confront his past. Tell us more. Yeah, um, he's kind of come out of prison. He's, he's got into a new relationship. Um, he was a very violent guy in prison and a very violent guy in his life. And he got to that stage where a lot of people get into when they hit their 40s. It's like sort of um, this is the last chance I have to kind of change my life or turn it around or make it into something different. Uh, and I kind of decided that um, it had to be something quite extreme to change him, basically. And because the character had kind of died for me in a sense, he wasn't really going anywhere dramatically. You know, he was, he was either going to be dead or in prison and there's not a lot you can do with a character like that. So uh, I decided that the only way to redeem him was to kind of throw lots of love and lots of art at him because that's really how people change their lives around. Mm. It's either by love or by art, basically. Or, you know, in his case, it was both. So I kind of, um, I surrounded him with a loving family and I stuck him in California and made him a successful artist. And um, he'd... Uh, I'd kind of done this originally by writing this story for the big issue homeless newspaper in the UK that I kind of thought about how he might change and sort of played around with his his kind of um, change. And this book kind of came out of that, that I got intrigued and interested in the character. Uh, and then I thought, well, test him, you know, put him back into his own environment where his own friends and his peers and his family expect him to be violent. You know, and this, in the case of this book, his son has been murdered and they expect him to take revenge on the people who've killed the son, or the people who believe to have killed the son. But initially, he's not interested at all. It's only when he's, um, his ego starts to kick in and he realises that his reputation means a lot to him, and he realises that violence is kind of means a lot to him. It's, it's really who he is, and he goes on that kind of journey. It's a big and, test for him. Yeah. Now, Train Spotting was your 1993 debut, followed by the 2002 sequel Porno and then the 2012 prequel Skag Boys. Now we've got The Blade Artist and its uh, sequel uh, reuniting the same Motley crew. What makes you come back to these characters time and time again? Uh, I think they just get crash into the, you know, your consciousness, and if you've got, a, you know, the light like tools in a box. If you've got a theme you want to explore, that you know, you look and see. It's like a job. You look and see if you've got any tools that will fit. Um, and um, and I think also, you know, the, uh, you know, because I was working on Train Spotting Two for a couple of years beforehand, with um, you know, not just with John Hodge and Danny Boyle, but, but also with the, the kind of broader creative team and the. Um, and uh, the actors, and so you, you get saturated in it, you get saturated in conversations about these characters. So they're kind of, uh, you, you, you're pushed into that world almost. And, it's, and they stick they stick with you. They do stick with you, and it's like they become kind of common property, really. They, you know, they're, they're so well known now, they're, they're not really mine as such, they're the, kind of, they're the worlds, basically. That's interesting. And I'm just the kind of custodian who has to bring them, bring them another adventure. Now, Francis Begbie is one of your most frightening creations. Uh, why did Begbie deserve his own story? Uh, I don't know if he did. I don't think he deserves much, really. But, you, get, you know, it's not always what you deserve. It's what you get, kind of, in, in life. But uh, I just felt that um, I was quite interested that, that if somebody who kind of um, would be incredibly kind of sort of violent and lost and then kind of become found and redeemed or seem to be redeemed, but still had this impulse towards towards violence and towards kind of um, causing mayhem and, and chaos and still buzzed on that. <clears throat> how would they how would they reconcile the two, you know? Mm. And that's what he's really trying to do, you know, isn't it? and sometimes successfully, sometimes not very successfully. Mm, as we see in the book. Well, for more on your characters, we spoke to Rob Hayden, who directed the 2011 movie Irvin Welsh's Ecstasy, adapted from your short story, The Undefeated. Take a listen. White doves, the club drug, the hug drug, the love drug, X, E, MDMA. 
100% pure ecstasy. The characters that Irvin Welsh writes are very unique. They have their almost their own language, their own tone. Uh, they're very entertaining. It's almost like he's writing about friends he knows in Edinburgh <laughs> or wherever he is. It's almost like they're 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 such three-dimensional characters. They're almost like real. That was uh, Rob Hayden there. Now, Irvin, one of the questions we ask ourselves uh, when uh, reading The Blade Artist is whether people deserve a second chance. Is this book a commentary uh, on whether people can truly change? Um, I don't really think it is. I don't see it in kind of terms of, you know, universal ambition in that way. I mean, I don't you know whether people can change or not. I think everybody changes. We all, we're all changing all the time to a degree. Um, whether we fundamentally change our personality, you know, and and, uh, and you know change our outlook on life, is a kind of different thing as well. But and it's kind of beyond the scope of a novel. I think you can only you know you, you have to kind of um, find some internal you know some journey in the character, and uh, it'll resonate with some people. I mean, some people will be very depressed about the message. You know that, that you know in, in some ways the message of that book is that. Um, once an utter, always an utter. You know, we don't mm. really change. We just channel our obsessions into something different. Uh, and I think that's the way. I think that's the way we do change in a way positively. Is that we kind of um, we harness all this energy that we've put into to bad places, and we try to put it into positive places. Um, and I think that you know, for me, that's kind of you know that's the the, the message of change in, in a sort of um, in a broader sense. For the purposes of that book, though, it's not very dramatic. You know, if you have kind of a bad guy becomes a good guy, um, fair enough, you know, mm. but that's the journey over again, the, you know, the good now. Uh, you, you've, I like a little bit more of an ambiguous or kind of, or, or a darker kind of twist in the story again. Um, and you have, to, you have to remember that, um, you know, while you kind of, uh, you can aspire towards all the, the artiness that you want in the book, but you have to entertain too. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, if you kind of, um, if you, if you keep yourself kind of guessing a little bit with the story, if you keep yourself guessing with the character and trying to work out who that character is, it's, you know, it just makes it a more interesting tale. Now, there's a sequel uh, to The Blade Artist. It's called Dead Men's Trousers, and it just came out in the English-speaking world. Uh, what more can you tell us about that book without giving oh, away the first one? All I one? can say is it's just gone straight into number one in the Sunday Times bestseller oh, well. list. So, um, Bravo. Well so, done. yeah, so that's like kind of... Um, that's a very nice thing for me, like kind of 25 years later, to still be doing this kind of thing. It's just such a big privilege, really. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's like, it basically starts off with the blade artist left. I won't tell you what happens in the last couple of pages of the That's blade right. artist. No, no spoilers. No spoilers <laughs> there, but um, basically it just carries on from there. And okay. uh, it introduces all the other characters from Trainspotting as well, who aren't really in the book. I mean, I think there's, there's maybe a little bit part, mm. sort of smidgen of one or two of them, but it just goes on from there. Now, your stories are often gritty tales that explore Scottish identity and the Edinburgh working class. Uh, a lot of your novels also feature the Scottish dialect uh, on the printed page. How important is it to have that common thread running through everything you do? Um, I think, you know, to me, it's, 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 a way of, um, it's a way of finding the characters and making them real. You know, I, I mean, when I first wrote Trainspotting, I tried to write it in standard English. And it just seemed pretentious and nonsense. You know, the characters weren't coming alive. They weren't thinking. They weren't thinking and talking and reacting in that way. Uh, and I think the, the interesting thing about the um, about kind of um, you know sort of street language or living language or whatever or vernacular, or whatever you call it, is very performative. You know, so uh, when you actually see somebody not just speaking language but actually performing it, getting mm. up and doing it, you know, and the way people do. Uh, in Scotland and Ireland, and the kind of Kel in some of the Celtic kind of parts of the UK, but also some other kind of parts of the, the UK too. You know, it it brings the whole thing to life. To life. You know, you know and it kind of it brings the character to life. Now you're a proud Scot, but you're living in the US now, if I understood correctly. In less than a year, the UK will no longer be <clears throat> part of the European Union. How would the train spotting universe fare in a post Brexit world? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that's like there's there's massive changes ahead, and I think that um, Brexit's through really the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, these changes have been brewing for over 35 years. Has been a, a, a kind of um, 
you know, our technology is changing, our kind of um, our economic system is changing. You know, we're moving into a world where we can no longer um, guarantee to pay wages. You know, we can't. So everything is gone. When wages go, profit goes. You know, the whole basis of what we know as capitalism goes and changes and adapts. And um, we haven't been able to come up with anything else. So there's this, we're all in this big existential crisis. Now, before we go, Irvin, we do like to ask our guests about a film, song, exhibition or a piece of art uh, that's on their radar right now. Irvin, you chose the recent Disney Marvel blockbuster, Black Panther. Why? Well, I went to see Black Panther when it first came out in Miami and um, it was like, it was just interesting for me. It was kind of... Um, I, I was one of the few white people in the, the audience. Um, most people were black, and they, they went to they went along to see this, and it was an incredible. I've never been in a cinema where I've seen such an emotional reaction to a film before, and it was just in one level, it's just a superhero genre, and it's again, it's a good superhero film, but it's just another superhero film. But on another level, it, it imagines a country that's not been colonised. So it imagines kind of the potentialities of a, of an uncolonised Africa. It's almost like this is kind of. Um, been some kind of a game changer. Well, I was just going to say the same thing. Indeed, it was a game changer. We'll leave you with a clip of Black Panther and his adventures in Wakanda. Once again, thank you very much to our guest, Irvin Welsh. His book, The Blade Artist or L'Artiste au Couteau, is available here in France and its sequel, Dead Men's Trousers, is also out, but for now, just in English. Catch up with Encore on our website and stay in touch on social media. Keep it right here on France 24. Son, it is your time. Show me my respect and bow down. You get to decide what kind of king you are going to be. Don't freeze. I never freeze. The revolution will not be televised.